you may turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14. A few weeks ago, we, I preached some beginning a little bit at the, uh, the beginning of the chapter, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And uh, as we looked into that passage, the Lord was talking to his disciples, trying them to to get them to know why he had come was not just to razzle-dazzle the people with miracles. It wasn't just to go and to heal people's bodies. It wasn't to be the earthly king of an earthly domain because he said, you know, that's not my kingdom. That's not what it's all about. We've been looking at a series on why did Jesus come, and two weeks ago in 1 John, he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to put that uh, behind us. He came to, uh, well, he came to take care of sin the next week. He came to help us deal and to take away our sins. Uh, today in John chapter 14, beginning at verse 6, Jesus came to show us the Father, what the Father is like. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, at the end of that last interaction with the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the only conduit to get there. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth you know him and have seen him. So from here on out, you have seen the Father. <laughs> I don't know about if you're like me, but sometimes Philip and some of the disciples were thick as a brick. I can totally relate to that. You know, sometimes men don't always get the hints, ladies. Because God is trying to get our attention, sometimes we don't get things that are plain as the nose in our face. Keep reading here, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus just gets them telling him, you've seen the Father. He says, uh, show us the Father. And it suffices us. <laughs> we'll be happy. We'll be satisfied. Just show us a little picture. <laughs> and here's Jesus. And I don't know if he did this, but it's, it went something like this. This is a visual. Have I been with you so long? <sighs> You're not getting this, boy. <laughs> That's not how it says in the King James here. Have I been so lo a long time with you and you have, not, you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father... How can you be there and how can you say, show us the Father? The Lord is at work. They weren't getting it. Do you realize that many people have had a viable witness of who Christ is and they don't get it? I would submit most of us probably didn't get saved the first time we heard the gospel. I hope you did. Sometimes Satan has blinded someone's eyes. They have believed a lie. They have not grasped the total truth that Jesus would really save them. The disciples had walked with Jesus, and they still weren't getting it. You know, things don't, are not always the way they should appear, but uh, or, or as they really are. We have to ask the Father to help us to see what he's trying to tell us today. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has been sent to reveal us the f love of God, the holiness of God, everything about all the facets that we can grasp. And as we walk in this world, we figure out that these things apply to us. Help us to understand your ways today. Show us your ways. Help us to understand why you came to this earth. Help us to see the Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get too far into the sermon, I was, <laughs> I was, I was reading something on the internet the other day, and it said a lady went shopping for a tie for her husband. A very high government official, and she found the perfect green that would just go with this one suit that he had. And so she bought the tie. And he proudly wore it to work and went through the security checkpoint and, you know, the thing. And everybody stopped and froze. The Secret Service, you know, came over. It was a high government job. And they, 
you know, they detained him and they got the wand out and they're looking all around and they said, take your tie off. We think there's a bomb. Right, man. <laughs> Secret Service whisked it away. Of course, the, guard, the, the senator, whatever his position was, he was above reproach and, you know, he went on to work without his tie and a few moments later, the Secret Service agent comes back and goes, we thoroughly inspected your tie and there was a little button, and he said, we found when we push it, it plays jingle bells. <laughs> <laughs> something so innocent, woo, sets everybody off. And something so major, if Jesus come to this earth, a lot of people didn't get it. Sometimes we just don't get it. I don't get it. I, I, I don't know, do you still find that as you're living your life, and you're experiencing God's promises that there is so much more to understand about how much God loves us and cares for us. I think when we peel back and we get to heaven and we can look back, we're going to see all the times that God intersected our life that we were totally unaware that he was there. The times like the footprints in the sand where he carried us along and, and times where he gave us divine and imparted wisdom and help and probably knocked off a few angels' wings when that car came really close and God spared us. You know, we have a guard. I, I, I don't know, but it, this I do understand, that sometimes as we're going along, we don't understand even one another. I put down, misunderstandings happen. Everyone who is married says, I had that experience. Don't say that loud. Rob and I, when I was dating this blonde girl that was to become my wife... I went to her house, and they said, would you like a piece of cake? I said, sure. And they gave me this little, it was like a sample. <laughs> of course, being polite, I don't say a word, because in my house, you got a slab. In her house, you got a, and they said, would you like ice cream with that? And I said, sure. And they gave me this, like, half a scoop of ice cream in a Corel cup. You know, and you don't want to look like a pig, but you're thinking, I wonder if they don't like me. <laughs> They're not going to feed me. They're sending me away. You know. Well, my family was noticeably larger than her family. <laughs> and uh, my home, you got a couple scoops, and, uh, you know, they were not sending a message. That's the way they live. But sometimes we can get the wrong message. We get misunderstood. How you go through those things, Character is revealed when you, when you carry on in a good way and continue holding the course. You know, earlier in, in, in the book of Matthew, I, I, this is my interpretation, Jesus taught with authority. One time they said about Jesus, nobody else taught it like this. This guy teaches the scripture with authority. That's because he was the living embodiment of the word of God. He, he wrote the book. He ought to know what's in there. But you know, John's gospel gives us some of the behind the scenes stuff. And when we look at Philip, after Jesus just gets done saying, if you've seen me, you kind of you've seen the Father, you can say, hey, show us, show us a father and we'll, we'll be happy. And, and Jesus is going, have you been with this was a culmination of Jesus trying to reveal who God was and is to us. So let's look back in the book of John. I call it some passages or snapshots along the way to see where Jesus and John interact. It's important because we're going to get an idea of when, what the Father looks like and how God the Son interacts with Philip. So go back to John chapter 1. And verse 43, and here's snapshot number one. The following day, John 1, 43, the, following, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, follow me. What a compelling two words, follow me, come after me. Now here's a young boy, Philip, who is a fisherman. He had maybe some spiritual longing into his heart, like every Jewish boy. He wanted to be a follower of a rabbi. He got passed over, and they said, go get a job. So he goes, and he fishes with the family business. 
And along comes this rabbi, seeks him out and says, Philip, follow me. Philip, this guy who had been passed over several times, is so excited. He, he's going to drop everything. In fact, he's so excited. Look, verse 40. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip finds us Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can there any be good anything come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. This is tremendous missionary work. He didn't really, Philip just goes out and he tells what he knows. He says, do you know that Moses, who talked about a redeemer, who, who gave us, uh, led the people out of Egypt, who was instrumental in, in bringing the tabernacle and all the, the worship and sacrifice. So we found the guy that all these things point to. And then all the prophets said, there's someone else coming. There's, the Messiah is going to come. He says, we found him. Now, this sort of comes to my thinking. He had to have a spiritual background, but he was like uh, sort of on the side. You know, there are a lot of people that you and I witness to that don't seem to give evidence of being a Christian, but they have a tremendous depth of, of spiritual background. And they're waiting until Jesus walks by. They're waiting for someone like you and me who have had a divine experience in our heart. And that's exactly what Philip has at that moment. He believes everything he's heard and read and studied because he meets a living, breathing, God in the flesh kind of guy. He says, all the scripture, all the promises are fulfilled in this guy. Everything the Father has written is, is there. He was the first one called. Old Testament teachings taught about how mighty God was, how holy God was, how people needed repentance. He told all those things. I don't know how long time elapsed or like later on, you know, Jesus says to his disciples, who does men say that him? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and you say, wow, what a revelation this flesh and blood is not to reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, right? The Holy Spirit energized God's word to Philip, and he believed it. And he changed. And he goes, says, Nathaniel, you're never going to believe what I found. I would say, I'd submit to you that he's probably one of the first missionaries or evangelists to go to tell someone, and he says, you come and see. You know, it's an interesting, people have been always searching for God. We live in a very technological age, and uh, I'm going to make a statement, I hope it comes off right. We have a lot of smart people who have figured out a lot of wonderful things that are ignorant of God. It seems as though God reveals himself to people and they choose not to believe. In fact, the more things, I have been reading up on scientific things and I am told, of course, I, that's not my uh, sphere of total, you know, I, I did all right in science, but you know, you're not looking at... Uh, you know, I, I don't read a lot of science books. But I am told today that a lot of scientists have come to embrace their faith because they can't explain God out of the picture. They have to say, they have to, they have to take him by faith because they say there are some pieces to this puzzle that we cannot figure out how this happened other than that there was a divine being involved. And I'm thinking, hey, doesn't the whole earth declare the glory of God? Doesn't all these, aren't all these things, they are going to reveal who God is if we're watching for him. Philip is, is, is he had this longing in his heart and he is watching and Jesus says, follow me. It wasn't like, you're like, follow me, you know. He says, uh, come, follow me. And, and Philip had such a hunger in his heart to please God that he leaves the nets behind and he goes. 
And the word of God became alive to him. You know, faith arose in, in Philip's heart and changes him. It's interesting, sometimes, to me, the more people God revealed himself in the Old Testament, the more corrupt the people got. Some of the first kings, you know, Saul started out pretty good, but he got sort of messed up by the end. David had a few double clutches on his way, too. You know, uh, can I just say it like this? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. For righteousness. It was put into his righteousness account. He was a lot more righteous and pure than I think a lot of the kings were. And the further you go down into the kings, the less holy they become. You would think we'd learn. They didn't. See, the morality was not based on an intimate relationship with God. Ours is. We sometimes sing a song, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. You know what? Joseph got it. I cannot sin against my God. He says those wild words, and they're true. Sometimes our concept of who this universe is doesn't allow people to have room for God in the picture. I really feel bad. Sometimes we have to think of it like this. The greater the universe, the greater the God who made it. The more things we understand, we ought to be filled with more awe and wonder than ever before. Amen. When they start looking at quarks and all the little pieces of the atom and all that, and you're going like, Whew. what kind of mind designed all this? Of course, if you ever look at a, gener uh, a giraffe, you say, hey, what kind of mind can see that? <laughs> hey, leftover parts. Yeah, we'll put this one on there. You know. But interesting, all the things that God has done. You know, someone says, look at all the stars. You know, God put those out there for night lights. He put those out there, but he says to Abraham, you see all those stars, Abraham? Yeah? He says... Uh, I think about you more than all the stars in the sky, all the grains of the sand. I, I, I continually, and, and he says, <laughs> God put those things out there to sort of keep us busy and entertain us to a certain degree. They have really nothing to do with salvation. You know, I think we've learned to navigate by them and to do certain things. We are sort of dependent on one star called the sun for solar energy and heat and things like that. But the problem is that God has given us all these things and we seem to have gotten more corrupt and not more pure as the time has gone on. That sort of bothers me. The God who came to reveal himself, people can say, well, I, I opt to not believe that. And so they're going to believe that some kind of primordial ooze. If you want to come from slime, good luck, but I, I, I came from a God who created How's that for a, a theological construct? I, he didn't explain all the ins and outs to me. He said, Jeff, you'll never figure it out. Trust me. It's always been when we come to faith in the Lord that our lives are changed. Philip's life was changed because he had faith. Everything that was written, Old Testament, all the things we heard at synagogue, hey, they all point to him. Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, ah, I don't get it. He said, you come and check it out yourself. That's the Christmas message, isn't it? Come see where the Christ child lay. Check it out for yourself. So that's the first snapshot of Philip's interaction. And really it tells us a lot about Philip and tells us a lot about the Savior. The Savior who came because he sought Philip out. He's the first guy that Jesus seeks out. Well, you know what? Jesus still is seeking out people like Philip who want a godly relationship. I'm glad for that. It tells me that he took the initiative. God took the initiative to come to where I was because I couldn't figure out how to get to him. Isn't that the Christmas message? And God became flesh and dwelt among us because we couldn't be godly because we had sin. Second snapshot is found in John chapter 6. And John chapter 6, I'm going to just points to it, but we're not going to read 
all the stuff, all right? I'll just tell you the story. You know the story anyhow. Jesus is coming uh, into this one area near the Sea of Galilee. He goes up to pray. And the people keep coming. And they're hanging around. And Jesus saw the needs of people that they were hungry. And he asks a question of Philip, not to put Philip on the spot, but to see where Philip's heart was. You know, sometimes you and I go through some difficulties, not of our own making, but we go there to God says, okay, let's see what they've learned. It's sort of like a test at the end of the, the marking period. Let's see what they've comprehended. Jesus had just been healing people. He had just been doing greater things. He says, you know, I, I, great John the Baptist, all the stuff that's going on. Verse 5, when Jesus saw, they then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. He said unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Hey, is the bakery open, Philip? And, and, you know, it really was, uh, in their culture, that was a meal, to have, sit down and have bread. And uh, Philip says, he's sort of taking a quick check count. He says, mercy sakes, we need 200 days worth of pay. Two, every, every denarii, every, every one day you got one. He says, this is going to take two, three. I, maybe, maybe Judas had given the treasure report to the disciples that morning. <laughs> I don't know how much was in it. He said, man, it was going to drain the account. Philip looked at himself and he says, oh, baby, we're in over our head. You ever feel like that? Amen. In this life, oh, baby. I mean, way over my head. That's not real King James version there, but you know what I mean. And... Sometimes I can so totally relate to Philip because I'm in my, over my head most of the time. Uh, try, we have to, and what it does is it causes us to trust the Lord. At least I hope so. So Philip counts the costs. He figures out what it's going to take. He says it's going to be a lot of money. By the way, we don't know if they had a lot of money. We don't know if they had enough amount of money. You know what? You and I come to places where we don't have enough. I want you to know that the thing that the takeaway from this whole when Jesus feeds the 5,000 is he has enough of whatever you need. If he, you need bread, he'll show up with bread. If you, if you need butter, he's got the butter for your bread. But it's more than that because Jesus takes this time to take it out of the natural. And he, in this context, in John chapter 6, he tells this great declaration, I am the bread of life. I'm the one who will sustain your soul. He asked that, you know, the question of Peter. And, you know, Jesus has all the resources. He can satisfy your physical need and your spiritual need. And he just wants you and I to know that he can do well, anything that needs to be done. So now, first off, Jesus says, you know what? I'm seeking people. I'm looking for you. I, 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 I'm fulfilling all the word of God. I'm fulfill, a total fulfillment of all the promises. And then he reveals himself to, to Philip and the disciples. I have enough for you and then some. There's always left over when Jesus is He's a God of more than enough. You know, if you need saved, he is more than enough to save your soul. There's enough grace in this room to go around for the whole world. He's never depleted. He's, he's never without something. You know, there are people that do not believe the miracles of God. You know what? <laughs> this is a, a true story. One person was trying to explain the miracles of God. And so when he said, where will we get all this stuff? He sent the, the disciples fishing. And they quickly stocked up a cave with fish and bread. And then Jesus backed up to the cave opening and they were, they were giving him the food through the pieces of his garment. You know, like the flowing robes. 
could you do this with me? And that's in case God is striking. That is so dumb. What kind of... What pe when people choose to not believe in the miracles of God, they say that my God is this big. The God that I know and I serve has enough power that you can't contain this whole whole world can't contain his wisdom, his understanding, his power, because my God is all sufficient. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. And he cares so much for me that he can bring that down into a small and little bite-sized pieces that I can understand. One of the funniest things is every once in a while we give Mandy the wiener dog a bone. And at times we have given her bones that have almost been as big as she is. And it's been really funny because she will proudly take that bone and it's like she's going to eat for a lifetime kind of deal. She takes that to try to hide it. Where do you hide something this large? We try to grasp the bigness of God. And he can't be hidden. And when he appears, people have to lie to explain away who he is. But people who have spiritual understanding say, My, you know what, eye has not seen and ear has not heard neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them who walk uprightly. You know what? God is preparing a place for us because he has a lot of stuff. See, if your God's been small, I'm sorry for you because my God is big. My God is powerful. My God knows what's happening tomorrow before I have a clue and he prepares me today. This is some of the things that Philip was supposed to be getting along the way. We have the benefit of, of, of the Lord's interaction. It's written down. The, scripture brings, the Spirit brings that scripture alive so that we can know that there is no lack in our God. Physically and spiritually, God is more than enough for our task. That's our takeaway from that interaction. Let's skip on to John chapter 12. Third interaction. Now we are still before the text when Philip so ignorantly says, hey, could you just show us the Father? And Jesus says, I've been doing that all along. Are you not paying attention, Philip? And you know, I think maybe those words could echo to our nation and our world. Are you not being, for 2,000 years, are you not getting this world? <laughs> Come on! By the way, are you counting down to the end of the Mayan calendar? I'm not, but I just, you know. Interesting. Some people couldn't see too far beyond where they were. But my God's already been there and back. He knows what tomorrow holds. The best thing is he holds my hand. I can get there. I can go through that. And, and he will help me. John chapter 12. Here comes some guys that want to see Jesus. They've heard about the miracles. And, and let me preface this. These were not just ordinary Greeks. These were Jewish believers or people who had come to synagogue. They had come there out of respect to, for Jehovah. They had heard about this Messiah. They had a spiritual background. It was just not like guys off the street. Hey, we want to see the guy. That's not how that happened. These folks had an insatiable desire to be around and to hear the godly things. And so they come and they, they find out where Jesus is. In John chapter 12, it says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. They, the prerequisite here is they were spiritual people. 
And they came therefore to Philip, which is of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, Sir, if we would see Jesus. We heard about this guy who's called God as our salvation, and we want to know more about him. We've heard about his miracles. We came here into town for the worship. But before we get to the worship part, we want to see this guy they call the Messiah, the Christ. They had a hunger. They were desirous to... Uh, figure out where, and Jesus took this occasion. Now, if you read the whole rest of that part, in John chapter 13, verse 20 and through 27, he said, you know what, guys, I've got to tell you, the reason I really came here is not to razzle-dazzle you with the miracles. It, it was not to feed a group of people with some bread. It was not to, to, clean, to heal every sickness. That's not the, the only reason I came here. And he takes this occasion to say the real purpose that I came here was to die on the cross. And I'm not afraid to do that. In fact, the hour has come, verse 23 says, that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he tells them the story about death. He tells them about putting a corn of wheat into the ground. And if it doesn't do that and it dies, then it's not going to bring forth a fruit. And they're not getting it. But he says in verse 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. And he talks about following him. And... and uh, he says, you know, but this, for this hour, at the end of verse 27, for this hour is the reason I came. And this very moment, this is why I came. He is there to give his life. And he knows the disciples, you know, they're not getting it totally. Later on, Jesus says, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. He's trying to prepare them. You know, I, I'm going to go to a place. I'm going to send another comforter. And he's going to lead you and to guide you into all truth. He's trying to prepare them. They're not getting it, but he's trying to help them. On this occasion, Jesus says to us, I, I'm seeing. Be, he said, oh, by the way, Father, glorify your name. Jesus saw beyond the cross the glory that would be his in eternity. He saw that when he dies on the cross, that your sins and my sins were perfectly atoned for. He saw the joy that would come to someone's life when they got their heart delivered from sin and began to live for God. He saw the thrill of what it would be like when we invest our loved ones into heaven. He saw eternity. He saw everything whole. He saw the whole picture. And he says, you know what? I'm willing to go to that cross for the glory. Of Father, glorify yourself. This is your plan. I'm willing to die on the cross. And he was not so crazy, man. He just sort of winged it. He knew there was a plan of the Father. He says, the Father has a plan. One place he says, it's necessary for the Son to lay down his life. You destroy this temple. Hey, in three days, I'll, I'll raise it up again. I have the authority to lay down my life. I have the authority to pick it up. They didn't get it. But you and I ought to. We ought to. See, this was always the plan. See, the Greeks came looking for, a, a, you know, a savior, and he says, I'm going to show you what the savior does. The son of man's going to die, but he's going to be resurrected. He says, the father will be glorified. Let it happen, father. Up until this time, he was always saying, my time hasn't come, but now he says, it's time. Why did Jesus come? He came to show us who the father, he had a plan all along. The takeaway from this, you know, God had a plan. Jesus had to die so that you and I could be saved and God will be glorified. So now we come to the, our text. We've already had a couple really, and, and this does not include all the interactions that, that Philip was among the disciples when he saw Jesus turn the water into wine and, and, and uh, heal the sick and raise the dead and, you know, all this kind of stuff going on. And he's like, he's having a spiritual overload, if you please. For three years, he walks with Jesus. 
And at the end of this time, he says, hey, uh, you, 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 you get the puniness of the question now? Hey, could you just show us the Father? Jesus says, I've been with you all this time to show you. He says, nothing I do, I do of my own accord. I do it in the plan and the will of the Father. Not one word misspoken, not one action that can be misinterpreted. Tells us how wise our God is. See, Philip saw a lot of these things, but he didn't put the pieces of the puzzle together. And every once in a while, Jesus would, would give these, I call, pop quizzes. In Matthew chapter 11, he says to the disciples, well, some people say that, uh, you know, well, by the way, who do you think I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Messiah. God made flesh. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one of your kind. And then what does he say? Flesh and blood have not revealed this, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter, you got it. Uh, sometimes, Peter, the practice, uh, if, note up here in doing it is sometimes very hard. I, I'm not excusing Peter, cause some, but sometimes I know things and I don't always do the right thing. How about you? I'm so glad for God's grace, and he helps us. But really, the question for you and for me in John chapter 14 asks us to look at the evidence and say, has, what has God and how has God been revealed to you? Are you getting it, how much he loves you? Are you, forget, are you missing out on how much he has forgiven you? Have, have you seen that God is not quick to judge, but he is slow to anger, but he is full of compassion? Have you gotten that, church? Have you seen the kindness of God? I can, I can look back in my life before I really committed my life to the Lord, and I can see where God really helped me, where he worked in my behalf. Have you seen how God has been patient with you? You know, no one at the, at the end of this time, whenever it ends, can say, God hasn't been patient with the world. God, in fact, Peter writes, God is... He is sort of staying off. You know, he's not willing that any should perish. He's, he's hoping, he's desirous for people to get their hearts right with God. That's a whole different picture than the world says God's out to get them. Scripture says, if God be for us, who can be against us? He's a God who is willing to forgive. He is a holy God. He is a just God. I mean, you look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira, you can't say, well, you know, it's a good thing to lie to God because they died. He said, I'm, I'm holy, but I'll still forgive you. Jesus came to show us the Father. Are we getting it? Is our world getting it? Bow your heads with me, please. Father, your interaction, your recording of what Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long and have you not known me, Lord? Have we hung around godly things and still not seen you at work in our hearts? Has our nation been blessed and has not given God glory? We sang that chorus, that song, To God Be the Glory. Have we received the goodness of God and still not gotten it. But Jesus said, I came to show the Father. I've been the embodiment of all the law and the prophets. I've been a God who is more than enough for your material and spiritual hunger. A God who was willing to carry out the plan even though it caused death. His death procured my freedom and yours too. You know, we're challenged 
to come to grips because knowing why Jesus came and receiving the work are two different things. And living according to that knowledge and with that knowledge in our heart that Jesus did everything. If I receive him, he will take away my sin and make me righteous. He's not holding it against me anymore. Church, that's, that's good news. Jesus came to deliver us from the works of the devil. He came to save us from our sin. And he came to show us the compassion, the love, and the provision of the Father. In this quiet, sacred moment, maybe you're here today. You've never seen Jesus quite like this. A God who loves you, a God who will forgive you, a God who will help you. I'm here to tell you he's a God who will forgive you. You need the forgiveness. You need to ask him to come into your heart and take away your sin. We'll pray with you. Oh, not in a judgmental way. We're, we're fellow travelers. He's come and taken a lot of our sin away. And we're dependent on him. We just enjoy, encourage you to join in the, the forgiveness. If your heart's not right with God, you need to ask him to be your savior, to forgive you for your sin. If you'll slip your hand up so I can see it, I'll just pray along with you and for you. God will help you because he will. Anybody at all, mom, dad, young, old? The other part of the story is, church, are we living what we know? We have a God of wholeness. Sometimes we live fragmented. We have a God of total forgiveness. Are we walking like we are forgiven? We have a God who has a plan. Are we afraid when he's in charge? Are we living the truth that Jesus came to show us the Father? If we look back and we see in our lives that many times God has intervened, we can say with a surety, he's been good to me. And you're here today and you say, I just am, I'm more acutely aware today than ever before that God is in total control of my life in this world. And you say, I just, I, I'm glad for that. I, I'm rejoicing that. You raise your hand and say, I, let's just go raise my hand and praise God for rejoice. I'm, I'm going to rejoice in that. We ought to rejoice in that. Anybody else? You were just saying, Lord, I want to rejoice. Lord, as, as we, we identify with that, there are so many things in this world we don't understand, but this thing we do know, you care for us, that you provided for us, and we want to live so God gets glory. So he, he you know, the, how we live, we need your help. We need a constant infusion of your spirit to work in our hearts. Lord, help us to live like we've seen the Father. Help us to interact with other people so they will see the love of the Father in us and give him glory. Help us as we take steps of faith in this world that is counter God. They're just against your ways. Help us to be the bearers of righteousness in this world that we can show that there's a God in heaven who knew the plan and forgave me. Help us to live like forgiven people. I pray in Jesus' name. Stand with me and sing, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. Why don't you just close yourself in and thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. Aren't you glad that he did come to show us the love of the Father? Aren't you glad to show us the Father 
And now let's walk in that way. Let's walk in His ways. Let's allow that to be alive in our hearts. Some people were going to come to the altar today and you're just going to seek the Lord. If you're one of those folks, we encourage everyone to take steps toward the Lord. We need to sometimes just let the Spirit of God wash over us. It's been a tough week. I need, a, I, I need a fresh infusion of his power every day, don't you? I need him to, I need for wisdom, I need him to direct my paths. I need his help. The best news is he is here to help us. So we have time. There'll be some, we're going to sing this chorus just one more time. There'll be some who just come seek the face of the Lord. Some are going to come and gather to pray together. And that's okay. If you need to go, you may go quietly and reverently so as to not bother the people around you. But there may be just some people that God is doing something extra special in today. You just want to seek his faith. We have time for that, don't we? Okay, we do. We're going to sing this song as our benediction. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. You may dismiss yourself when you're done at the altar. You may go. And the Lord bless you. Amen.